Chapter 15 Voices of Protest Or in other words, democracy is faking. Within a few months, when the end of the WW1, the big one, the world in all wars, both black and white troops began arriving back in the United States for discharge. Now, some blacks were left behind to assist in cleaning up the mess of war, but for the most part, the majority, with tribulation and some joy, they found the ships to sail for home. But home to what? They'd heard the rumors of the bad things happening while they were still abroad, but there also had been hope. Hope that now things would be a little better. And the first arrivals back in New York City must have been totally surprised and a little bit reassured. The parades were grand. More than a million people watched the all-black 92nd Division march. Other cities were the same. Buffalo, St. Louis, and Chicago all watching the troops black and white marching back home. But in the South, well, different story. The crowds were not as large. And the enthusiasm, oh, not so much. Why? And I think your text points out that, well, there really weren't that many black units from a single place in the South, but first and foremost, the Southern white man did not look kindly on a black man in the uniform of the United States and carrying a gun. But it was a time for joy, and most of the black soldiers were going to enjoy it, no matter how short a time it lasted. They had hoped for a better world, but they knew deep inside this type of reaction was not going to last. The Americans were tired of war. They were tired of killing. Tired of having their men gone. They wanted to get back to the everyday method of living and working. The industry desperately wanted to get back to the business of business. They wanted to manufacture items to sell to the general public, not just wartime goods. The labor unions who had been held at bay during the war were, well, they were more than eager to get back to protesting and demanding better working conditions and higher pay. And the politicians, well, they were more than eager to get ready to get back to business and politics. And the Republicans, well, <laughs> they were ready, willing, and able to take on President Wilson and the Democrats. And certain black leaders were also eager to see that a return to normalcy did not mean a return to business as usual in the black communities. But think about it for a minute. If you're white, man, how would you have viewed the article in the crisis just months after the troops returned? We return from the fighting, fighting. We save France and we will save the U.S. of A. or know the reason why. Folks, them are fighting words if you're a southerner. Now, the black leaders in the states had already begun working for this day when the troops came home, but so had the KKK each one working in different ways for the proper place for the black man. Quote, Uniting native-born white Christians for a concerted action in the preservation of American institutions and the supremacy of the white race, unquote. That was their stated goal. And more than 100,000 white-hooded members of the Klan had worked very hard. They used violence and intimidation to put the black man in his place. But unlike the original plan, this new version, well, it didn't like anybody. It didn't like Jews and Catholics and Japanese or any Oriental for that matter or anyone who was foreign born. In other words, unless you were a wasp, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and born in the U.S. of A., you were not wanted. Now, the original KKK had started in Pulaski, Georgia. And this is an example of what it was like. Uh... It breaks my heart to see the Capitol in the background with those white hooded radicals. And of course, then they had the audacity to stand in the form of a cross. My disdain is showing, and I apologize. I'm supposed to be objective, but I can't be with those people. Like I said, the original KK was started in Pulaski County, Tennessee in 1865 and forced to disband in 1869. And the Klan that was started again in 1915 was not in the South but the Midwest, and the members were not rabid former slave owners, rather they were white and blue-collar workers of the Midwest and North. And one of the biggest clans was in our sister state to the North, called Indiana. And it's not just the ordinary people, many, 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 many times, 
It would be the local officials, the sheriffs, and the judges who were also members. Throughout the South and Southwest, the KKK began forcing the black man back into a position of slavery. And if you were a black man and you did not accept the white man's word as law, you were subjected to whipping or branding or tiring and feathering. And believe me, that one will kill you too because they dip you in hot tire, then they put feathers on you. And when that tire dries and cools, it pulls your skin off. They'd hang you and they had public burnings. The black man who had fought so valiantly for his country was treated worse than we would ever treat a traitor. Soldiers wearing their uniforms were hanged in the South for no other reason than that they were black and they had presumed to be as good as a white man. And you ask why lynch? Why not have a trial if, they, if there was a crime or a suspected crime? And of course the reply, no black man accused of a crime going before a white judge with a white jury was ever going to be exonerated. He was going to be convicted, so why waste the time of a trial when you knew the verdict ahead of time? Red Summer, also the time of the Red Scare. And the Red Scare, of course, is a uh, fallout, as I said, from the Russian Revolution, because back in 1917, when the uh, Russians had their internal revolution, you fighting against the Tsar's force. The Tsar's forces wore white uniforms and were called the White Troops. The Bolsheviks under Lenin and Tolstoy were wearing red and they were called the Reds. And red has become synonymous with the word communism. We don't even say communism, they just say he's red. Or if you're slightly red, you might be a pinko. So the Red Summer, not the same thing as the Red Scare, but they both involved bloodletting. Basically between June and December of 1919, there were 25 race riots in our American cities. You see this great migration of southern blacks to the city had not ended with the war. But now instead of welcoming them, they were in competition with the white worker. And in competition, uh, as before, you're kept also competing for housing. And the inability to get work and homes, combined with the attitude of the whites trying to eliminate any gains that the black man had made, was like adding kerosene to a burning fire. So an already combustible situation was made even worse because now the blacks seemed to be more eager and able to fight back. A situation that the white man was not going to let happen. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on some of the riots. I'm, I'm hoping you got sick at your stomach when you read them. May 1918. Valdosta, Georgia. Husband and wife hung. And the wife was pregnant and they pulled out her unborn child and stomped on it. July was a bad month. July 1919, Longview, Texas. Local whites were upset with a black school teacher because she had written an article about the lynching of another black. So going into an all-black neighborhood, uh, they were shot at. Well, not to be outdone, the whites, and, and they were very alarmed over the fact that the blacks had actually defended themselves. So the whites went on a rampage. They burned black homes and they flogged black men and several bleeding black citizens were forced out of town. Same month, same year in our capital, Washington, D.C. There were rumors floating around of blacks assaulting white women on the streets. And a mob of white military men ran through the streets, killing and injuring any black person they saw. When the rioters attempted to go into the black neighborhood, the blacks fought back. And in this case, the number of whites killed and injured was greater than the number of blacks. And that scared the bejesus out of the whites. Same month, same year, Chicago. Now, Chicago has always had a rather large black population, but there always seemed to be plenty of jobs to go around. So the job the trouble wasn't over the lack of jobs. It was over housing. You see, the black man had had the audacity to attempt to move into an all-white neighborhood. So some black homes were bombed, and some black men just mysteriously disappeared. Some wound up dead. And toward the end of the month, when a black man swam on purpose or accidentally into a white swimming area, the problems really began. I think you've read in the book, there's an incident there where a black family is told they couldn't swim in an all-white area, and one of the black children asked the mother, what was the white water like? Anyway, this black swimmer, after having rocks thrown in, went under the water and didn't come back up. The black community declared he had been murdered, and Katie barred the door, the fight's on. Whites and blacks were victims over the next few days. The riot spread, and for 13 days, Chicago, even with the help of the militia, could not gain control. In the end, more than 38 people were dead. 
15 whites and 23 blacks and 537 were injured but more than 1,000 blacks were homeless. It was the worst race riot ever in our country and it forced some people who had declared there wasn't a race problem in our country and to face head on that there was a race problem and it was very very serious. During August and September 1919 there were riots in Tennessee and Nebraska and Arkansas. Senseless rumors could, could and did spark riots. But the one I found particularly upsetting was in Omaha where a vigilante mob took a black man accused of attacking a white girl out of jail, dragged him through the streets and shot him more than a thousand times. They mutilated his body and I think you realize what that means and then they hung him. Fortunately for the man he had already died but other blacks, innocent ones, were beaten and homes were destroyed or damaged. And in Arkansas, an attempt to get reasonable rents, a peaceful meeting was broken up by the local redneck sheriff. It turned into a fracas in which a deputy was killed. Well, of course, several blacks were killed too. And in a, a kangaroo trial, 12 farmers were sentenced to death, 67 others to long prison terms. And six years later, the Supreme Court reviewed the case and it overturned the convictions of the 67 convicted to long prison terms, but they didn't do a darn thing for the people who were already dead. But over the next two years, this type of senseless violence against blacks continued. All it would take was for a white person to accuse a black man of something, and usually it was rape or assault, and there was going to be a riot and a lynching. Rosewood, Florida, January 1923. Let me tell you a little bit more than what we've got up here about it. On January the 1st, 1923, a massacre was carried out in the small, predominantly black town of Rosewood in central Florida. And the whole thing was instituted by the rumor that a white woman by the name of Fanny Taylor, she had said she was sexually assaulted by a black man in her home. So a group of white men, believing this rapist to be a recently escaped convict named Jess Hunter, he was hiding in Rosewood and they assembled to capture their man. But just before this had happened, there had been a series of incidents that actually stirred up racial tensions. But during the previous winter, a white school teacher from Perry had been murdered. And on New Year's Eve of 1922, there was a Ku Klux Klan rally held in Gainesville, just located a very short few miles from Rosewood. But in response to the allegations by this Fanny Taylor, that white men began to search for Jess Hunter. They also were looking for Aaron, Aaron Carrier and Seb Carter. They thought he was, they were his accomplices. So Carrier was captured and incarcerated. Carter was caught and lynched. But the white mob suspected that the guy that uh, they had incarcerated, his cousin was supposed to be hiding him out. His cousin's name was Sylvester Carrier. So on January the 4th, three days after the supposed attack, a group of 20 to 30 white men approached the Carrier home and they first they shot the family dog. And when Sylvester's mother, Sarah, came to the porch to confront the mob, they shot and killed her. Well, Sylvester defended his home, killing two of the men and wounding four in the ensuing battle before he too was killed. The remaining survivors, black survivors, fled to the swamps for refuge where most of the rest of the African residents, uh, African American residents of Rosewood had gone. They wanted to avoid any further, you know, let's, let's just get the heck out of town. The next day, the white mob, white mob burned the carrier home. Then they joined a group of 200 men from the surrounding towns who'd gotten together and had heard erroneously that a black man had killed two white men. So as night comes down on the little town, the mob attacked Rosewood. They slaughtered all the animals and burned the buildings. Now the official report claims six blacks killed along with two whites. Other accounts suggest a much larger total. But at the end of all this carnage, only two buildings remain standing, a house and the town general store. Most of the residents of Rosewood had already fled to the swamps and they were evacuated on the 6th by two local train conductors of John and William Bryce. Many others were hidden by John Wright, uh, the owner of the general store, and other black residents of Rosewood fled to Gainesville and to further northern cities. So as a consequence of this massacre, Rosewood became deserted. Now the initial report of the Rosewood incident presented less than a month after the massacre claimed there was insufficient evidence for prosecution. So no one was charged with any of the murders. But in 1994, however, as a result of new evidence and a renewed interest, the Florida State Legislature passed what they called the Rosewood Bill, which entitled the only survivors, there were nine of them, 
to receive $150,000 each. And I don't think they got an apology either. House on the left is, because you can see they didn't have that great a housing to begin with. They burned the homes and they lynched some of the residents. 1925, a black doctor was accused of killing a white man who'd been throwing stones at his home in a white neighborhood. And did you catch the half had lawyers that came to his defense? Clarence Darrow? Mm. He was also the one that was in on the monkey trial in uh, Tennessee. And Arthur Garfield Hayes. They did get him acquitted, but the white people won. His reputation was destroyed and he had to leave the area. The frequency of the lynchings in the South did decline from the mid-30s on. And we have no idea why. Uh, did state anti-lynching anti statutes finally slow some people down? Uh, was the, it the courageous but failed efforts to induce federal anti-lynching legislation in the 30s? Uh, did it kindle something in the southern sheriffs? Or was the southern culture itself changing in response to the growing widespread anti-lynching sentiment in the rest of the country? We don't know. And believe me, there have been many, many analysis and papers written on this particular subject. But nevertheless, it angered the whites that the blacks were even trying to move into their areas of work and home. But what frightened them the most was that the blacks were fighting back now. So you've got to blame somebody. I know it's the Bolsheviks. That's what it is. It's communist inspired. Or those black soldiers associating with those degenerate French during the war. So the Red Summer and the Red Scare were going on at the same time. And if you were not wasp and red, white, and blue, or you deviated in any way from the norm, you were a Bolshevik, even if you were white. But one thing the black community had learned from all these dreadful years and problems, it was not going to be easy. It's going to take more than just words or even physical fighting to end all this violence and the divide. Now the NAACP, <laughs> they got together. And they were protesting loud and long for not granting first-class citizenship to the black citizens. And it would be the NAACP that was going to take up the fight against bigotry and injustice and get programs started and try to get a law passed against lynching. I think just a minute, is it against the law to murder somebody? Sure it is. But if a murder is committed in the community, uh, who does the arresting? Who does the prosecuting? Who's the jury? White people. And it's a local issue. Sure, the Supreme Court can get into it, but it's usually too late. And here again, who are the witnesses? So make it a federal law. Then the federal government can step in and do their thing and take it out of those local white people's hands. A bill was introduced in the Senate in 1921, and it got passed the House of Representatives. But the Senate, controlled by white Southerners, used the filibuster to defeat it. And over the next few years, there were many attempts to pass the bill, but they all met the same fate. The Southern-dominated Senate wasn't going to let it happen. It wouldn't be until 1968, and I repeat, 1968, that that massive civil rights bill was passed, that a portion of it was made lynching a federal crime. But keeping track of all those lynched and writing books about the inhumanity of white man's justice was a goal of the NAACP. They began to gain some justice for blacks by a series of court cases, and although I don't expect you to remember them all, we will mention them. But Nixon v. Herndon, the U.S. Supreme Court declared null and void a Texas law that kept blacks from Democratic primaries. Well, Texas isn't going to be told what to do by a federal court. There's more than one way to skin a cat. So then Texas passed a law that gave the Democratic Party the authority to decide what the qualification for membership was. And in Groby v. Townsend, the courts refused to interfere in exclusion of blacks in primaries when it was a result of a resolution by the state convention of the Democrats. So they took a step forward, and now they took a step back. But in Smith v. Albright, the court decided, well, you know, excluding blacks from the primary, that's a violation of the 15th Amendment. So it's like a yo-yo, forward, back, forward, back. And a commission was formed in 1919 to try to improve race relations. It was called the Commission on Interracial Cooperation. But it didn't attack segregation. It just spoke out against discrimination. Now, they did set up offices all through the South, but no matter how hard the NAACP or the Commission worked, they seemed to be unable to reach the majority of blacks or whites. They needed some help in the transmission of their message because 
as your text states, the African Americans of the lower social and economic levels all regarded such organizations as agencies of the upper class and a bit elitist. And you really can't blame them. Uh, there was a widespread impression that these people were just not like me. And we even have some type of this feeling in our country today. Um, you don't always trust somebody. And I, I know poor George Bush number one got a bad rap because he went shopping and he didn't even know how to use a credit card or what the scanners were because he'd never gone shopping before. It'd be kind of like me being placed in charge of the college. Uh, I'm not exactly stupid, but I have no idea how to run a college. But that doesn't make the director any better than I am. It just makes him smarter in certain areas. Um, I'm not better than anybody else, but I can make a well of a apple pie, and boy, you can't beat my fried chicken. But that doesn't mean I'm better than you, it just means I'm a good cook. I digress. So we're starting to have protests now, not by the feet. We've got this massive migration of anyone who can is getting out of Dodge. So the educated and the better off blacks are moving to the north. And the southern black leaders are very worried because with all the black leaders gone, who's going to set examples and help the poor blacks in the south? The whites are worried because their workers are dissipating. <laughs> I'm sorry, that should be disappearing. The workers were disappearing. And at the same time, we've got this massive migration of people from the Caribbean. Now, the Caribbean blacks and the American blacks, well, they've got different ideas, uh, different backgrounds, different educational levels. And most of the blacks from the Caribbean come from Jamaica and Barbados and Cuba, Puerto Rico. And they're usually English speaking and educated. One, for instance, is author Alfonso Schumberg, a Puerto Rican historian, writer, and activist in the U.S. who, who did a lot of work researching and trying to raise the awareness and, of the contributions of the Afro-Latino as well as the Afro-American. He was very important. He was an intellectual figure in the Harlem Renaissance, although I don't think your text mentions him that much in the next chapter. And over the years, he collected literature and art and slave narratives and any material on African history to find. And then it was purchased to become the basis for the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture, one of the first things to come along. But we also got some important new black voices. They're called the New Negro, which would be a little bit New Negro. This is a term that's coming into term into usage in the early 1920s. Now, A. Philip Randolph, which we've already looked about, he writes about race and class. Hubert Harrison, who's Caribbean born, born he's began to challenge W.E.B. Du Bois' philosophy of the top 20%. He also started something and headed something called the Liberty League for the Blacks. Uh, two men called Biggs and Moore founded the African Blood Brotherhood in 1918. They also edited an Afrocentric magazine, The Crusader. Now, are you familiar with what Afrocentric means? Um, it basically means that you think everything that's good's happened has come from the African. Uh, Cleopatra was black. Um, Socrates was black. Uh, the Africans invaded Rome instead of Rome invading Africa. Everything is just, any event is because of a black man. Randolph and Chandler defended the white left. They criticized the NAACP as being elitist, and in a way it was. It was run by very highly educated and usually moneyed black and white people. Now, Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, I don't think we mentioned him too much, but you see, we've got this little technicality. When the war was over, we refused to sign the peace treaty because we didn't like some of the terms. So even though there was no fighting and all of our troops were home, technically, we were still at war. So, Attorney General Mr. Palmer, he would use wartime rules to arrest people, a great deal like our Patriot Act. Now, he'd arrest them with no warrants and put them in places and didn't charge them. And he began to accuse the uh, leftist blacks as being red, the communists. Like I said, they weren't red, white, and blue. They're communists. And into all this comes Marcus Garvey. Now, Marcus Garvey... <laughs> is one of the most interesting individuals I've ever had the pleasure of coming across in history. He was something else. And the more I read of him, the more I wonder. Was he for real? Was he just playing mind games, or did he really believe all that he was preaching? Actually, I have more questions than answers. 
And if you've read this section of your chapter, you'll know what it means. So I'm going to give you a little bit more information about him. But first, let's look at a couple of pictures. Uh, the one on the right, he's sitting in a chair like, you know, he's got the uh, college garb on, like he's a real important college graduate, which he wasn't. But he's also sitting there like a potentate. But then on the left, you see him in the back of this open car that he rode all over Harlem with. Uh, you know, he was a potentate, but big time. Now, this is him in his uniform. Roly poly guy. But he was born in Jamaica in 1887, the youngest of 11 children. The seven preceding him had died, so he was the first one to live. And according to the biography I read, he inherited his interest in reading from his father and made full use of a very extensive library his father owned. At 14, he left school to work in a print shop, and he became involved in Jamaica's first printer's union strike and began to publish a small newspaper. He wanted to accumulate funds for a future project he had in mind, so he left Jamaica and went to work in Costa Rica. And it was there he first experienced the realities of prejudice against blacks. Because in Jamaica, you're 99.9% .9 black, there was no such thing as discrimination because you were black. He encouraged the workers in Costa Rica to form unions and began a newspaper where he wrote scathing attacks on the poor working conditions of the blacks. Well, the Costa Rican government didn't like this. So they expelled him from their country as being an undesirable alien. So he returned to Jamaica, upset at what he'd seen in Central America, and he began to uh, lay the foundation for his proposed Universal Negro Improvement Association. He moved to England to live with his sister, and while there he worked for a newspaper called the African and Orient Review. In 1914 he founded his association with the motto, One God, One Aim, One Destiny, which I think is a good motto. His association set the Negro Factories Corporation to help promote economic self-reliance among the blacks in England. Then two years later, in 1916, when he was only 28, he moved to the United States. And after he arrived, he became a black nationalist. Now he really gets interested. He believed, according to what he preached, that Africa was the ancestral home and spiritual base for all people of African descent. And his political goal was to take Africa back from European domination and build a free and united black Africa. And you remember, we've already talked about colonization, how there'd been a meeting in Berlin to divide up Africa by the European nations. Well, Garvey adopted this back to Africa movement and organized a shipping company called the Black Star Line. That was all part of his program, trying to conduct international trade between black Africans and the rest of the world in order to lift up his race and eventually returned to Africa. Now your text mentions how he attempted to get land from Liberia, but when that failed, he organized the Universal African League to rid Africa of the white man. And I don't know if you were able to keep a straight face or not when you read about him telling the world about his empire of Africa and how he appointed himself the provisional president. He had one potentate and one supreme deputy potentate. He created something called the Knights of the Nile and Knights of the Distinguished Service Order of the Ethiopia and Dukes of the Niger. And he wore uniforms and he paraded around as often as possible. He was successful. Man, he had millions of followers. But did he really believe what he was preaching? And although his astronomical claim of millions, uh, we don't really know for sure, but it, it, there was an awful lot. All educated African-American black leaders denounced him and his republics. Oh, excuse me. They were just insecure thieves and traitors. I have a puppy who doesn't like people walking down the hall. Catches! Maybe even Garvey had something to do with W.E.B. Du Bois' later disillusionment with the black race. Garvey's statement that the NAACP wanted the blacks to become white and that the blacks would have to, should be proud of being black. Well, you know, when you think about it, it rings of a much later leader called Malcolm X. Black power. Black is beautiful. But Garvey was convicted of mail fraud because of purported mismanagement and lack of sufficient funds. And according to our text, his wife said he collected more than $10 million and only spent one on the Black Star Line. He was found guilty and sentenced to five years in the penitentiary. He only served two years before President Cruz pardoned him and in 1927 had him deported as an undesirable agent, alien. <laughs> Back in Jamaica, he continued to work with the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. He dabbled in local politics 
1935, he moved back to London, where he continued to work, but now his popularity had flown and he died in obscurity in 1940. Negro Zionism. Now, Zionism, by definition, is a policy of establishing and developing a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine. So Negro Zionism would be the plan for developing a homeland for the black man. And going along with Garvey's idea, that homeland should be Africa. But just as the colonization plans of the 1850s and 1860s failed, so this one would too. The black man in America had no desire to return to Africa. Now, Garvey's following really had more to do with dissatisfaction of the blacks had with their black leaders and lack of a viable plan than any desire to leave the country. They didn't want to leave, they just wanted to have equal rights. And then there's Father Divine. Whoa! Father Divine is one of the most perplexing figures in the 20th century African American history. He was the founder of a cultish religious movement, and I've got it, I guess you'd say abbreviated here, and I'm going to give you a lot more information about him. Uh, he's the founder of a cultish religious movement whose members regarded him as God. Father Divine was also a champion of equal rights for all Americans regardless of color or creed. He was a practical businessman. He had a lot of retail and farming establishments, flourishing during the Great Depression, which was very unusual. And he was regarded by many members of the traditional black church as an imposter or a lunatic. But Divine was praised by others as a powerful agent of a social change. And along with many cult leaders in the Depression in New York, he provided economic benefits for thousands of his disciples. Now, the early biography of the man, who later called himself Father Divine, is kind of a patchwork of guesses. Um, he was apparently unwilling to discuss his life except in the spiritual aspects, and believing himself to be God incarnate, he felt the details of his worldly existence were unimportant. So the result is that most historians are just not even sure what the original name or place of birth. Most agree that Father Divine was probably born 10 to 20 years after the end of the Civil War, somewhere in the Deep South, and his given name was George Baker. And as portrayed by the accident colloquialisms of his speaking style, he seems to have grown up in the rural South. We kind of figure the part of a family of farmers struggling to survive under the burdens of economic exploitation and racial discriminatory Jim Crow laws. So at an early age, he escaped the drudgery of farm work by becoming a traveling preacher, working his way north to Baltimore in the year 1899. In Baltimore, Baker worked as a gardener first, restricting his preaching to an occasional turn at the local Baptist church on Wednesday night prayer meetings. He had a very powerful speaking style, and he began to be encouraged by his fellow churchgoers. He was, uh, I guess you'd say, stubby, rotund, he was a little bit chunky, had a very high-pitched voice. But he enthralled the listeners with his fluid storytelling and his very emotional delivery, like most Southern churches do. But he was a restless man. He had opinions that no one else had, and it wasn't long before he felt he had to resume the life of a traveling preacher. So he returned to the South with two specific goals, to try to combat the spread of Jim Crow segregation and to offer an alternative to the otherworldly emphasis of most established churches. Such a crusade was not going to be with success because indeed Baker was fortunate not to be lynched. Yet, it reflected a concern for social issues that would remain constant throughout the long career. He returned to Baltimore around 1906, and he fell under the influence of an eccentric preacher named Samuel Morris. Now, Mr. Morris had been thrown out of a lot of churches for proclaiming himself to be God. I believe he derived from a passage in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, which asks, Know ye not that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So using this teaching, he provided Baker with a very good religious foundation for his social activism. So if God lived within every human being, all were therefore divine and hence equal. So Baker became Morris's staunch supporter and disciple, and Morris took to calling him Father Jehovah. And while his prophet, Baker, adopted the appropriate name and title of the messenger. It wasn't long before the messenger again felt the need to spread this gospel southward. In 1912, six years later, Baker set off for the backwoods of Georgia. Now, at some point in his travels, we don't know for sure because the writing's not there, 
Apparently, Baker realized that if Samuel Morris were God, so too was he. And he therefore referred to himself as a living incarnation of the Lord God Almighty. Now, such a claim was naturally alarming to the pastors of the churches where Baker was about to preach. And he was arrested in Valdosta, Georgia, as a public nuisance who was possibly insane. And the court recorded his name as John Doe, alias God. But with the help of a local writer who took an interest in the messenger's tragic story, Baker was released and told to leave the state of Georgia. Instead, he was promptly rearrested in a nearby town and sent to the state insane asylum, whereupon his benefactor once again freed him. Though Baker's theology was no doubt peculiar, he did impress people as a man of sound mind and deep moral commitment. I remember his attorney later told the New Yorker that there was about the man an unmistakable quiet power that manifests itself to anyone who came in contact with him. Hmm. Well, Baker soon tired of his troubles in Georgia and in 1915 made his way to New York City, bringing with him a handful of disciples that he picked up along the way. And with these followers, Baker set up a communal household, which income was shared and a life of chastity and abstinence was encouraged, all under the direction of Major J. Devine, as Bert Baker was now styling himself. The Major Devine preached the doctrine of God within each individual, but there was never any doubt among his followers as to who was the actual incarnation of the deity. Only Devine. And the name inevitably came to be spelled Divine. Divine helped his disciples find work, and they in turn entrusted him with the management of the group's finances, as well as their spiritual well-being. So by living simply and pooling their resources, Divine's movement was able to purchase a house in suburban New York in 1919, by which time Divine was also taken as his wife, a disciple named Penea, I can't even say it, P-I-N-N-I-N-N-H, Penea. Now, in contrast to his earlier public preaching, which had often expressed the need for racial equality and justice, divine spiritual work was now confined to the salvation of his followers that was based on harmony within and between individuals. Now, to the outside world, Father Divine was a quiet, well-respected member of the Savior community, otherwise all white, who ran an employment agency for the many African-American men and women staying at his house on Lincoln Street. And divine was great at his profession. His church grew by leaps and bounds, and the preacher was a very shrewd businessman who not only found work for his disciples, he oversaw the investment of their common earnings with the talent of a natural entrepreneur. He taught his followers the virtues of hard work and honesty and service in their business dealings. He told them they had to achieve economic security in the world as preparation for salvation in the next. And under the guidance of Divine's leadership, his disciples gained a reputation as excellent employees and the operators of honest, efficient businesses. He called this following the peace mission, but it remained kind of unknown until the start of the Great Depression in 1929. And New York was full of such cult organizations, each boasting its own charismatic preacher and offering to the thousands of recently arrived black Southern immigrants an emotional brand of religion similar to what they had known in their own hometowns. But with the advent of the Depression, desperate economic conditions made the Peace Mission's generosity very intriguing and welcoming. Each Sunday at the Sayreville residence was set aside time for an all-day banquet free of charge and open to anyone who cared to attend. He would accept no payment for these feasts, nor did he take charitable contributions. He asked only that everyone sit down to dinner, behave in a Christian manner, and abstain from the consumption of alcohol. A word quickly spread of his miraculous bounty, and by the early 1930s, his Sunday dinners were attracting hundreds of hungry poor people, mostly black, but not exclusively so. But disturbed by the eruption of black power in their midst, the residents of Sayville had divine arrested as a public nuisance. A thorough police investigation had declared no signs of financial or more improprieties at the peace mission. The divine was sentenced to one year in prison by a judge who considered him a dangerous fraud. When the judge suddenly died three days later, divine's reputation as divine Christian was enhanced. Because like Jesus, he'd been wrongly accused, and now his persecutor was paid back in full. He was set free on bail, his conviction was overturned, and the peace mission attracted new followers by the thousands. Though his success in the 30s was indeed nothing short of miraculous, 
He moved his headquarters to Harlem as the center of the black artistic and cultural life in New York. And his peace mission rapidly added scores of affiliated branches elsewhere in New York, New Jersey, and as far away as California. About 85% of the peace mission were black, and at least 75% were female. Uh huh. Many drawn as much by the electrifying personality of Father Divine as by his social or theological messages. Now, his full fledged disciples were known as angels, and they were required to donate all their worldly possessions to the mission. But Father Divine was soon overseeing an organization of considerable financial size. And by all accounts, he did so honestly and skillfully. He helped his followers find jobs. He started innumerable small business. And after 35, uh, he bought some farmland in mission and covered over the mission in upstate New York. And all of this while the depression's going on. This, this is just unheard of. He did allow himself a few luxuries. He lived in the finest of the mission's many Harlem properties. He was chauffeured in a Rolls Royce and was rarely seen in anything but a very fashionable three-piece business suit. Father Divine never advocated the virtues of poverty. His scholars had too much of that. And in his preaching, he combined an almost fanatical faith with strict adherence to the ethics of American life. He urged his followers to raise from poverty by old-fashioned thrift and hard work and scrupulous honesty. To work in his eyes was to serve God. He was especially wary of the dangers of borrowing money, and all of the mission business was conducted in cash, even real estate being paid for in cash and in advance. Well, the flaunting of such large amounts of money naturally drew the attention of guess who? IRS. But it never found any irregularities in the dealings he had on the peace mission. And on the contrary, on many occasions, his disciples startled former employers or tradesmen by repaying long forgotten debts. In one instance, this involved a sum of 66 cents for a train ride taken 40 years before. Father Divine was economically independent. He thought this was a stepping stone toward the overall goal of racial equality. He was unequivocally opposed to any form of racial discrimination or even to the recognition of racial differences. For Divine, all human beings partook of the divine essence, and all Americans were due the rights granted them by the Constitution. He therefore purposely bought many pieces of property in all white areas, including a most notably an estate on the Hudson River, opposite the home of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, as well as a beachfront hotel near Atlantic City. He had extensive tracts of farmland in upstate New York, and when challenged by segregationists for such moves, he would offer to speak of the American way of life. And in an article published in the New Day and Missouri newspaper, he quoted as saying, my co-workers are followers and endeavoring to express our citizenship and enact the Bill of Rights in every activity and even in every community to enjoy life, liberty, and the reality of happiness. Wow. The end of the Depression, and while it kind of witnessed a gradual retirement of Father Divine, because he was already in his 60s, he was shaken by a lawsuit in thirty-seven by a former disciple who sought repayment of money she had given to the mission over the years. And after a long series of legal maneuvers, eventually resulted in the incorporation of the peace mission and Father's Divine moved to Philadelphia to get beyond the reach of the New York law. But of greater fundamental importance to the peace mission was the advent of war. When the American economy stamped out of the long depression and jobs became plentiful, well, the peace mission style of frugal collective living kind of lost its appeal, especially in a booming economic climate. And the organization began to stagnate. So he gradually retired to a quiet life of wealth outside of Philadelphia. But in 46, after his wife had died, he remarried to a 21-year-old white lady. His name was Edna Rose Riching. Man, it took every bit of rhetorical skill he had to explain this act of celibate divinity. But Edna Rose nevertheless went on to become a head of the mission, known by her cult name as Sweet Angel, and later simply as Mother Divine. Father Divine actually lived in 65, and little seen and not active in his remaining years, he did remain a very powerful symbol of hope for racial unity. He was a role model for some later generations of people of color. But he's probably best remembered as a man who, in his own peculiar way, acted in his own interest while skillfully advancing the cause of thousands of inner city African Americans. I think I have a picture here. This is of his home, and as you can see, a very sweet young thing. 
mother and father divine, and that Baker home was quite the dude. But now we've got the new Negro, so we're going to have to have the new Negro women. NACW, the Association of Colored Women. Its founders, Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and Mary B. Calvert, and Marie Baldwin. They were also among the founding quarter for the NAACP. They worked to not only get the vote, but they worked really hard at the anti-lynching law, which of course Ida B. Wells had been doing for years. They worked to not only get the vote, which was very important, and they wanted to be work part of the large women's rights workers who were working for the vote more than anything else, but they were not accepted by the national movement. Uh, the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Party, they capitulated to Southern racism. Uh, the South has a lot of power. Even Susan B. Anthony and a great woman activist espoused separate but equal. They were able to participate in some of the local organizations and they did work hard. But here again, you also have the same problem. Uh, they're educated upper class women. And sometimes there's a disconnect between them and the lower economics. But Ida B. Wells organized black women in Chicago to vote in 1915 because it wasn't until the 19th Amendment 1920 that women totally got the right to vote. And the South was really stunned by all those black women turning out to register to vote. And there was black means all over to help mobilize black women. Some worked with the white league of women voters, but the irony was is after registering to vote and voting, sometimes the people that they voted for actually insulted them. And strange but true, in the late 1920s, there's a lessening of black women's organizations being successful. The Red Summer could have contributed, but I think once they got the vote, the women's organization the, uh, for the suffrage movement is disappearing basically. It's, it's, what are you going to fight now? You've got the vote. And the woman became known as the black man's helpmate. Now the black woman has never been one to hide her, hide her light under a bushel basket. She's always been very strong, very forceful, uh, especially since the days of the emancipation. She would go with her husband to vote. She considered, even though she couldn't vote, that the vote was a family vote. She'd take a gun to protect her husband while he voted. And heaven help the husband if he didn't vote Republican. If he voted Democrat, he might wind up sleeping on the couch. And then Garvey comes along and says, well, let's go back to the days of true manhood when women truly revered us. Whoa. I don't know about you ladies in the group, but that gets my back up big time. Now here comes the 1920s, and our next chapter is about the Jazz Age, or the age of the Harlem Renaissance. I think you're going to like this chapter. I wish I was there because um, the OCC Library has Ken Burns' History of Jazz. It's an eight, eight uh, CD disc. And when I was teaching on campus, we used to so we'd sometimes take two and three class times to uh, do the Harlem Renaissance because the teacher likes jazz, and I would play way too much jazz because they've got some beautiful original recordings that have been re-digitalized. I don't know if I can get any on the, the thing next week or not, but I'm going to give it a heck of a try. If not, I'll tell you where to go to get some because until you heard some of the original jazz, mm, it was a beautiful time of music. But the entire artistic movement is going to be covered in, uh, I guarantee you they will have a long lecture next time. But go ahead and read the chapter. I think you'll enjoy it.